Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, if you join this webinar for the first time, I am Dawn Clark. I'm the Lettings and Property Management Director at Knock Dighton with over 30 years experience in the Shropshire and Worcestershire lettings market. Today I'm joined by two experts in their specialist fields. First of all, Joanne Sainsbury, who is an experienced investor and landlord who has built a portfolio uh, of mainly HMOs. I met Joanne at the Worcester PIN meeting, which you probably just heard me saying during our chat, uh, when she spoke of her journey in building her property portfolio, which I found very interesting. So she has kindly agreed to do the same for this webinar today. And my second guest speaker is Maria Schultz, who is a chartered legal executive and licensed conveyancer. Uh, she specialises in commercial and residential property and has a particular understanding of property investment strategies, including lease options, rent to rent, HMOs, serviced accommodation and delayed completions. All those who are attending the live presentation today will have the opportunity to ask the speakers questions by entering those in the chat box, which should be visible at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll read those out to, um, at the end of each speaker's presentation and then we can carry on any questions at the end. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Joanne. I'll just change the speaker view. And Joanne's just sharing her screen. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Really, really appreciate the opportunity. And yeah, it was great meeting you on the Worcester Pin. So my name is Joanne Sainsbury and my company is Silkwood Property West Midlands Limited. And we started this property company about two years, just over two years ago. I actually just thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, basically, for the last 34, five years, I've been self-employed. So I truly and utterly put myself in the unemployable category. Uh, I just don't think I could, could hack it, really. <laughs> um, I've actually had petrol stations, a, a chain of restaurants that I've run in London. That was the only job I did have. And latterly, for the last 25 years, I've had gift shops in Stratford-upon-Avon. And thoroughly enjoyed being a retailer, but it is very diff different to property. That was my shop uh, right opposite Shakespeare's birthplace in Stratford-upon-Avon. In 1999, I bought two flats uh, and I, so it wasn't an accidental okay. landlord. I thought I'd buy them for my, my pension and for when I, when I actually sold the shops, really. I actually do have these flats still today. That's one of them. It's the ground floor flat uh, in Leamington by the canal uh, and the other one's a little bit further away in Warwick. Over a longer time, I have uh, bought a few more properties, done them up, sold them, uh, and, and just dabbled in property. But, you know, retailing was my main thing, not property. But in 2019, I actually took the plunge and I sold my shops. I didn't have a crystal ball. It was January 2019, actually. But I am just so, so pleased I did get out of retail. I was one of the lucky ones to get out. And I did sell my shop as a going concern, which is great. And I'm pleased to say it actually is still there, though, as well. I've always loved property, as you can tell from where am I dabbling, uh, and didn't know what I was going to do in 2019, but came across more learnings about property and I actually decided to educate myself which I have to admit at this great age is really alien and it is really something wow am I actually going to sort of spend money on me and, and do some education and learn new tricks but you know you know an old job can learn new tricks and hopefully I am proving that uh, so I've been on a I finished now but I was on what was a year-long uh, course uh, with PIN and but it did end up being actually 18 months purely because of Covid and we actually whatever we did on Zoom we then met face to face as well so it's been a fantastic 18 months and I finished it actually about uh, a couple of months ago. On, on the course, I have to admit, you know, I just learned so much. A lot of it just blew my mind because there was me buying a flat, sort of remortgaging it, buying another one. And that's really all I'd done, doing one up. We learned commercial to residential. Uh, I actually learned, you know, title splitting by refurbing, refinancing and rent, the, the brewer, as you say. And that is, I think, where the company has actually, that's, that's my bias. That is actually what I do like to do. I really like to get it stuck on in there into the smelliest old property that you can find. 
deal sourcing, uh, rent to rent, the momentum investment, the raising private finance, which, you know, two years ago, I'd have thought, what? Ordinary people lending money to ordinary people. That, that just doesn't happen. But, you know, the last property I just bought, 75% loan to value was actually with a, uh, a, private, a, a private individual who's loaned the company the money. I've learned about purchase lease options and I've done an earn and learn. I did one in the early days and I'm actually currently doing an earn and learn with some people at the moment, which is great, where they sort of just look over my shoulder at this um, property that I've got, which is a newsagent shop that we're actually converting into two single lets, not HMOs this time, but most of them are HMOs. So yeah, HMO, sure you all know, but it's a house of multiple occupation. So I have focused on HMOs and on the right hand side you'll get a picture of the first one a couple of years ago. An HMO is occupied by three or more people that are not related. And uh, unlike single lets, you actually pay all the bills, the TV license, the water, the council tax, absolutely everything for them. Of course, unless there is students in there and then students are exempt. You do make a much, much higher income uh, than single lets. Uh, I'll go into sort of the nitty gritty and, and how it can be a lot more difficult, but you do make a lot more income. And currently, you know, rooms are going from 350 to 750 a month per, per room. I have a colleague who has a property in Leamington Spa. He's actually charging 750 per room. And this is a beautiful high end house, but it doesn't eat. They don't even have en suites. So it is amazing. And he's a six bedroom. This is. So I'll let you do the math there. Types of uh, tenants for the HMOs, which get the professional, the, the blue collar, the student, local authority, which I suppose really is DHSS that I'm talking about. And then you've got the registered social landlord or the charities. Uh, and currently one of my HMOs is actually let out to adults with learning difficulties. And the others I focus on are blue collar. Um, I think, Really, the HMO, uh, you need to look at the amenity standards. And I'm going to explain a little bit later on that if you do have a single let, how you can convert it to, to an HMO fairly simply. Now, every council is slightly different. And obviously, I work with Regiborough Council mainly and know my council and their requirements. Uh, if you would have to look up in your area. But I did just have a very quick look. And again, Telford, I believe, is very much like Redditch, where you need a license if you've got five or more tenants. That actually doesn't mean that you don't need to be compliant though. So if it is an HMO and you have three or more people, you don't need the license in Telford and in certain areas, but you do need to be compliant. Again, if it's six or more people, that goes into sui generis, which is a different ball game altogether uh, and needs, needs planning. And the other theory we have with the, with the HMOs, so like Birmingham, for instance, the whole of Birmingham is Article 4. So they've withdrawn the development rights in there for you to take a residential house and convert it into an HMO. Uh, you can buy a, an HMO that's already made in these Article 4 areas. Now, once again, it's not to say that you can't convert or you can't buy a house and convert it into an HMO in an Article 4, but the rules and regs, you really have to look at them. You don't have, doesn't have to have an HMO within so many metres of another HMO. You have to near be a bus stop. There's about five or six different things. So not many people do do it, but it is possible to convert in the Article 4 area. Uh, and I have had a colleague did it and he, he, he actually managed to convert something uh, into an HMO because it fitted the criteria. The criteria is different in every council. On the amenity standards, uh, I mean, in my area, once again, and it's quite similar, the single room needs to be 6.51, I don't know why the five one square meters. Uh, and a lot of houses you look at, and I'll come to that later, actually don't necessarily fit this criteria. The size of the kitchen, once again, and the facilities uh, and the, the workspace and the cupboards. So it's something like half a metre per person uh, for the workspace, and then they're going to have to have a cupboard uh, 
a high cupboard and a low cupboard and a space in the fridge and space in the freezer. So the amenity standards actually state quite clearly how big cubic foot your, your fridge needs to be for argument's sake for a five person or a four person or a seven person. Uh, it does explain it quite well in there. Again, the compliance. So I know I keep hopping on because every council is different and you do need to check. But basically in, in the HMO, you need the fire doors. But you can't just go and say, oh, I'm gonna slap a fire door on here. Uh, it has to be the surrounds as well. You have to make sure that the intermittent strips, you have to make sure that the hinges are all fire related. Uh, the actual closers are fire related. Um, so ev everything, not just here's a fire door. Uh, obviously it's the safety of the tenants, which is the most important and that's what's needed. The smoke alarm system um, needs to be interlinked and depending on the amount of uh, tenants in there, you can, it has to have a fire panel on some of them, they get bigger, mine are five and four bed and I actually only have an interlinked alarm system and the emergency lighting as well has to be done. Fire corridors and exits have to be thought. If you walk into one of these lovely terraced houses that you get and you go straight into a lounge and up the stairs, well, then you couldn't have that room as a bedroom without making fire corridor into it. And I'll show you some of my properties later that I've had to do that with. And of course, then you actually need to do your fire risk assessment. And quite regularly go back and do a schedule to test and record your, uh, you know, obviously that everything's working, that there's nobody in front, uh, no hazards in front of the fire doors, that they're all working, that smoke detectors, etc. And record that monthly, two monthly, uh, but that has to be done. So this is one of my properties uh, in Mount Pleasant. It's called the Little Minimo, which is a four bed HMO that we've done. Um, I think, you know, this was just a three bedroomed house and I was telling my thought process actually how quite quickly I realised this could be a four bed minimo and when I buy at the right price a four bed minimo can work. So if you've got any three beds out there you could be looking and thinking hmm, could I turn this into a minimo and make some more money here. Just give you an idea of the cost to convert this. So it's, it didn't need too much doing but I had to have five 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 fire doors and surrounds of course and everything else I've just explained uh, and the cost of this was about £500 a door, labour everything. I then had the electrician come in who did the emergency lights, the smoke detectors, um, that side of it and obviously the the electrical certificate that you need uh, as a landlord, that cost me about £800. The furniture was about £500 a room. It, it does vary uh, and I tend to put four foot double beds in. The reason I don't put the full size double beds in because to be quite honest, it's for single people. They can have friends to stay, but I don't want them to encourage them to stay any longer than two or three nights, which is what's written in the AST anyway. And the four foot double beds work really well. We had new carpets throughout, which was about a thousand. And then we did luxury, luxury vinyl tiles in the kitchen and the lounge area. I did make sure that they were water, waterproof, water resistant ones as well. Uh, and then we had the boiler checked and a few miscellaneous items, which I can't, you know, key slot boxes, so that if the tenants lose their keys, there's a slot box there and you can give them the code instead of tanking out there to have to let them into their room. So I think total, it was about £8,000 uh, plus VAT. So, you know, just under £10,000, I turned a three bedroom house into a fully compliant, you know, in my opinion, quite nice uh, HMO. So this is just a few little pictures of it uh, while we were doing the work and then some, some pictures afterwards. I have to say I'm quite lucky, my daughter who is doing A-levels at school uh, is absolutely loves the design side of it and the photography. So yeah, she, she's a great help uh, with, with, with the company in actual fact. That was her little shimmy. <laughs> she did these slides for me as well. The other property we had was called the Old Bakery. And it was actually years and years ago an old bakery and you can see the beautiful chimney uh, that is there. 
This was the lounge when I currently bought the place. This was an extremely smelly, smelly place. It really, really was. My poor husband, when I took him, after I bought it, I hasten to say, said, oh, you must have a vision because this was so bad. We had a gas meter here and a door here. So the door had to go, be bricked up, and the gas meter had to actually go outside. And then we turned this into a lovely bedroom. And then this was upstairs. The gentleman that was living there for 40 years before I bought the property, this was, these were his walls. We hadn't touched these walls, that was it. And then this is what we did to the property. So we turned it into a nice kitchen diner. Here is a fire corridor. So this was a bigger open space, but we had to come down the stairs and put in the fire corridor. And then you've got the picture of the bedrooms, these corresponding rooms here that we did to it. Okay. This was nice, a challenge. You can imagine the HMO office came around and we all stood and scratched our heads when we saw this little tiny door. Uh, Carlo is actually not the tallest of people, but uh, he's, he's at least five foot five, five foot six. So uh, there was a challenge here, but we did overcome the challenge. So what we did is uh, you've got, we put a vestibule here on the landing uh, and a fire door and obviously a panel and made this totally fire safe. And then they still have to this day, go up a little step and go through the small door. But there's a big sign on it saying, mind your head and something to protect the head. So you can actually see on the plan here, uh, that's what it was like. And then this is where we put it. So there is, is ways around it. And the, the HMO officer you know, was happy with that. And he, you know, we got his input in on it as well. And I think I explained a little bit earlier on that I had to move the gas meter in the other bedroom. So I think here you've got, you know, the, the big question, uh, self-manage or letting agents on these HMOs. First of all, you have to decide your tenant type. Um, and I think, you know, so we discussed the tenant type and tenant types don't really mix. So you really can't have anybody DHSS with the professionals and you can't mix professional with students. It doesn't work. So once you've decided on your tenant type, then you really have to stick to it. Obviously, blue collar and professionals mix, but that's probably about the only one. Um, so you can self-manage. Um, it's cheaper because you actually don't pay the agent and you get more money. You get to you always get to choose your tenants, but you get to sort of build up a relationship with tenants and meet your tenants and think whether they're going to fit your other tenants. And I think getting that right as well. I know I've waited over a month for a person I thought would be the right tenant rather than just having anybody move in. Uh, and you get to do that if you're showing people yourselves. And obviously you get to go to the property, uh, see it regularly and, and do the checks. A few benefits. We're going to come on to the disadvantages of uh, self-managing and I think in all fairness, hand on heart, there is an awful lot more disadvantages than there are advantages. And even though I actually currently do self-manage my properties, it is only a short term thing and I will be handing over soon. But at the moment I am still doing my own. So yeah, I know the disadvantages. First of all, finding tenants uh, is, is really tough. Um, once you've found somebody and you think they're right, you then got to go and credit check them. You've got to get their references from their employers, from their past landlords. You're going to need to see bank statements, you know, all, all that sort of thing for them. Um, you've then, once you've taken them on, you've got to sort out the ASTs for them, the short, short old tenancy, make sure you've got that right. Um, you've got to get their deposit and make sure you put your deposit in a, in a scheme, a government backed scheme. Uh, you've then got to make sure that you collect the money um, and that, yeah, you have to start sort of dealing with um, their, their problems if they want you in the middle of the night or, you know, you are sort of at their beck and call uh, if they've got any problems. Again, you're directly with them. The other thing is you actually have to go and do the regular compliance checks and sorry, sorry I just that's just buzzing in my ear. You have to go and do the regular compliance checks uh, and turn up to do that and sort out the maintenance and the emergencies. Uh, and yes, there's, maintenance never happens when you're around and you can do things. It actually really happens. You get the phone call when you're in the car on your way to holiday and you get a problem. So, yeah, that is the disadvantages, really. 
of uh, self self managing and managing the property. So I think you know obviously your decision but this is not Guyton and I know they're absolutely amazing letting agents so in my opinion uh, I would absolutely go with the letting agents to take all this headache away from you if you convert well single lets and or HMOs but especially on the HMOs as well. Um, so I think um, if I'm just sort of just doing a little summary and I've got a, a floor plan down here the reason the reason I've got this is because this is my, my property in, uh, in Mount Pleasant. So when I'm looking to buy a property, the first thing I do is make sure that my location is where I want to invest. Uh, and then, so if that ticks that when it comes through on right move or whatever, I actually then go to the next bit and obviously see what the price is. Now I know how much I can pay on whether the four bed, five bed, six bed, what will work at what price I can pay. And then the next thing on, Okay, I'm taking it back to bricks like I did the first uh, property. This isn't quite so relevant as long as the room sizes are fine. But whereas I don't want to do a massive renovation, only a fairly small 10,000 renovation, which is this one. So as you come through the front door here on the floor plan, immediately I could see that this was a living room, could be a bedroom straight away. Uh, you would then come in, go up the stairs, and then this was great because it had a WC here into the dining room and open plan kitchen. I would check the immunity standards and make sure that that was big enough for a four bed minimo. Then going up to the next room, the first thing I would do is actually look at the small bedroom. Uh, this small bedroom came out at 7.63 square meters. So we instantly knew it would be fine and we could make a bedroom out of it. I did still manage to get a four foot double bed in here and uh, some wardrobes on the left, which took up the whole space. It actually was very tight uh, and a tiny, tiny little desk. It doesn't look too small. Uh, and then uh, this was a nice big master bedroom, a no brainer, going up the stairs into the attic room. And this actually had an ensuite. So this straight away, I thought, yep, this is the property to go and see. I went, looked at this property, put an offer in, in actual fact, it got refused, somebody else bought it, but they say the thing of follow up. Uh, I followed up about two, three months later, which had fallen through. I had then offered 10,000 pounds less and actually got it. So yeah, it was a nice win-win, definitely. So in summary, yeah, HMOs are significantly more work, but more income. A three bed house, as you can see here, can easily be repurposed into a minimo. You can also add value to a property that you own or a property that you're buying with an extension, an extension above a flat kitchen, a side extension, a garage extension, all sorts of different ways to get in that extra bedroom. And of course, you can go out and buy a ready-made HMO, uh, which is ideal in an Article 4 area. You can write to landlords, you can go through your agent uh, and, and try and find a ready-made HMO as well. All I will say is whatever you do, make sure you do plenty, plenty of due diligence uh, be before you do and make sure it is actually fit for purpose and what you're looking to do with it. I would just like to say thank you very much. And there are my contact details. Uh, I love chatting property, absolutely love it. I love helping people. Uh, I have a diary link if anybody wanted a chat just to, just to talk anything through really. So yeah, please make a note of my details and I will stop sharing and hand back over to Dawn. And thank you very much, Dawn. <laughs> thank you, Joanne. That was, uh, that was really, really interesting. Um, I don't, think uh, we've got any questions but I've written down a couple of questions actually um, that um, I'll just change it back to sort of gallery view um, just that I've written down as, as I've gone along which uh, might be useful to share um, first of all if you are looking at, at, at a possible HMO in an area that you're not 100% sort of familiar with how would you look to see what demand there was for that area? Yeah, first, first I mean, one of the main things I would go on to is actually a spare room. Uh, and so we would go into spare room and see 
how many HMOs or how many rooms there are to let at a particular area. You can actually go into the filters and spare room and break it down into certain areas and everything more so. But what, what happens is when you look at the rooms to let, there's, there can be quite a few. And then when you look at the rooms, on the, if you go on the wanted, what's on the wanted side, uh, there's, there's two things there. And you can actually then put in, if you're going to have a non-smoking one, you can put in all the filters for non-smoking. Uh, you have to take it with a, a pinch of salt to a certain extent, but it's a really good way to actually see how many rooms there are to rent and then on the other side how many rooms there are wanted and then on the wanted side you can see the average room for the particular area broken down into postcode. Right okay well that's really good so that's the main place where people will, will go and register if they're looking for an HMO or looking for a room I should say. One of the main, I mean, there's Gumtree, there's Open Rent, uh, there is others, there's my, um, my Facebook Marketplace. So, mm -hmm. But I suppose Spare Room is one at the top, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, thank you. Um, and then the other one was, um, you mentioned, I think you answered the, the actual question in there, but I just wanted to clarify. So when you say that a, a licence is not needed for a three or a four bed HMO, but you need to be compliant, are you able to sort of get that sort of list of compliance uh, from the local authority or have you got to have a meeting with them? I think you sort of went through that with your mini mo. Yeah, yes, yeah. So so basically on the council, the council will give the immunity standards uh, for the HMO, what you need. Uh, and it will actually say for the three and the four bed what you need. And of course, in an article four, uh, you need a, a, a license for three people. Uh, and, the, and Coventry's got something on where you need a license for three people. It's like they're not Article 4. So that's why I'm to keep always saying that every council is different, but it will tell you what, what you need. Yes, yeah. And it is the fire regulations as well are the big one. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it sort of fire doors that you would need as well? Yes, yes. Yeah. So you would, yeah, for a three bed, you, you would really need. So you mean you can just have a, a three bedroom flat? Uh, and that's now counted as an HMO if there's three it, it, people that don't know each other living in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can all be on the same AST, but from my understanding, I think, but if, if they don't know each other, it's now counted as an AH, HMO. Yeah, yeah, right, okay, thank you. And the final question I had was, um, would you generally recommend providing en suites um, in an HMO, in an ideal HMO if there was room? I think it depends on the tenant type and it depends on the area and it depends now there is the buzzword that everybody wants on suites absolutely but you know if you go and turn your property into a uh, five bedroom en suite and you've got downstairs en suites and en suites everywhere you've, you've lost your exit strategy to actually really ever turn it back well you haven't because you can take it all out but to turn it back into a family home so I think it's on an individual basis yes this en suite people are saying is great now what everybody wants also it comes with a cost to doing a cost for letting now sometimes and blue collar workers where I am not everybody wants an ensuite uh, they really don't they're quite happy to have it a little bit more reasonable share a bathroom with possibly two or three people as long as you do a nice quality place and get a mix mm, okay thank you and we have got one other question uh, from Josh saying would you recommend attending a property investment academy before going out on your own or learn as you go along <laughs> Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I have to speak from experience and, and, and the fact that I've had this whole year of education uh, has escalated my property uh, journey, you know, probably by three or four years, five years, probably if I'd have just done it my own way and the only way I knew. So I would, of course, I'd say yes, but it's down to the individual uh, and there's loads of free information and stuff out there. And if you're really self-motivated, on the other hand, I think you can go and learn a tremendous amount just from free by free. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Joanne. Um, I don't think there's any more questions. No. Um, so I will now pass you over to Maria um, and change the speaker view again. There we go. Hi, Maria. Hi, Dawn. And hi, everyone else who's listening. <laughs> that was really um, excellent presentation, Joanne. It's, uh, I've been following Joanne's journey for, uh, I think, a couple of years now and, and really exciting to see 
you know, keep building and building and building. So um, yeah, I, I, I do follow Joanne's uh, journey quite closely. Um, so uh, I'm a self-employed property lawyer. Um, I used to be uh, in private practice um, for quite some time, quite a few years um, in the Telford area. And I mainly act for property investors. I decided to go self-employed on the 1st of June 2020, right in the middle of lockdown. Um, my firm thought I was crazy uh, and because I had a job and I just thought, well, you know, I'm going to give it a go. Um, and I did have a lot of clients follow me, which I was very grateful for. And I have over 100 clients now on my books and that's I've only been going a year and a half. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm really, really lucky um, that it's, it's worked out as well as it has. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today about um, just starting out on your property portfolio if you haven't quite uh, invested yet but are really interested in doing it. And I think this harks, harkens back to a couple of questions that was just raised, were just raised on Joanne's uh, presentation. Um, doing your due diligence, now that can come in all sorts of forms. Um, it can be attending things like this where you know you can meet people who, who you're happy to chat to you about how they've built their portfolio or you can go on formal property investor uh, training programs which can be quite expensive however you have to sort of weigh that up against you know the knowledge that you will gather to build your portfolio and also you know that the the cost benefit analysis you need to think about you know i spend two grand now but does that mean in three years time i'll have eight properties you know it it's it, it can be done um and i mean myself and my husband we only started um investing in property in january 2019 i was hoping to have five properties by the time i was retired um i've got three already um, we had no money, uh, no savings at all, just a you know, mortgage on our own house. And I was working and everybody thought because I was a lawyer, I must be absolutely loaded. Well, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> so and, um, you know, through through going to property investor meetings and just having some general chats with people about how to get into property, I soon learned there are definitely different ways to do things. Um, I mean, us, we had lots of faculty in this house and I just decided to take it all out. Because that is just, for me, from my opinion, it's money just sitting there doing nothing. And so now I've turned it into three properties, which are generating an income of about 900 net a month at the moment. So it's it's gone very well. Um, I've come to a bit of a stall at the moment because property prices are high. Uh, so I'm not really looking to invest at the moment. I'm going to wait and see what happens with the market. It's a bit funny. So we'll see. Um so there's different strategies uh, that I have learned about just by going to the networking meetings that you can use. A lot of them involve you not even putting your own money in. Um, it can be, as Joanne mentioned, private finance. You might have, you know, a friend or family, if you're willing to work with them, that have lots of money, don't really know what to do with it, um, but are willing to perhaps invest the money into a project that you want to uh, run such as just buying a single buy to let or um, an HMO, or you might be looking at doing, um, you know, sort of serviced accommodation like Airbnb, that sort of thing. So you don't always have to have a lot of money to start with. Um, you can also enter into agreements with owners of properties called rent to rent agreements. Now that is where you rent a house off the landlord for say, uh, you know, let's just call it 600 a month or whatever might be more, but let's just for argument's sake, say 600. It might be a three bed house, needs a bit of decorating or whatever. And you might convert that into a minimo and you know, you might get far more than 600 a month out of three tenants. So that means, you know, you get your income in from your minimo, you pay your 600 pound a month to your landlord. The rest is yours. Obviously you've got running costs. But that's another way of obtaining um, properties without putting up a great big deposit in the first place. And, you know, you can terminate the agreement. Usually um, there's termination provisions in there. If you think, well, after six months, I don't like this. It's not working. You can just walk away. Um, you know, it, you've tried it. And, and I think that's the key with property is if you don't get going, you'll never know what you could have done um, So we're, you know, we're sort of in that boat. We're very surprised. We managed to get three properties. And, uh, you know, as I say, we knew nothing about property investing when, when we started. 
I obviously knew the legal side. Um, I'd been working with property investors for, for quite some time and uh, knew all about these strategies, never thought I would ever even be interested in doing it myself. But it was too, uh, too attractive, I think, and uh, I got very, very interested in it. So going, um, going through some of these strategies, I mean, Joanne's covered HMOs uh, very, very well. She obviously got lots of experience in that. And, and I think the key to that, if you're new to HMOs, certainly, is to have a managing agent. They will take the headache out of everything. And yes, you will pay their costs. However, I think if I were to consider having an HMO, which we have thought about, I would have an agent straight away. We did have a managing agent for our three properties um, for about a year, but luckily the tenants we have in the properties don't give us much hassle at all. They're great tenants. They pay, hardly ever ring me up with any problems. So to be honest, we manage our own at the moment. But I think if we got some more, we might go back to having them fully managed um, going forward. So management is a big thing um, for HMOs. And I do meet quite a lot of people at the investor network seminars I go to that do offer management services on various different levels. So I, I do have contacts for that if, if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> so yes, the training courses, several out there, there's property investors network, there's uh, progressive property network, uh, a chap called Simon Zucci, you probably, a lot of you guys have probably heard of him. Uh, I think he's amazing. That's my personal opinion. Um, and I've read his book called Property Magic. I've got, I've seen some of his videos on, on, you know, different strategies. I think he's very, very practical. Um, and everyone that I've ever spoken to that's gone on his course has said it's excellent. So that's, you know, and Joanne is agreeing. So, you know, I think he is, if you're looking for something, um, where you're just brand new, uh, certainly look at his courses. If you're sort of kind of experienced in the area, but are looking to go into a different strategy, definitely look at his courses. Um, because I, I think, I think he is, he's, he has got to be the best. I, I would imagine, um, at, at training people. Um, now the thing that you need when, you know, you go out, you look at a property, whatever you think, oh, I like that. And that's great. And you want to move forward. You need a team of people to help you get that property. Now, obviously, I'm going to say you need a lawyer. That may or may not be me. But get a lawyer that understands property investment. It's a whole different aspect of conveyancing work. And this is absolutely no disrespect to any of the conveyances I've ever worked with. They're very, very good, the people I've worked with. But property investors have got a different mindset than a person who is moving house. Property investors, from my experience, they are interested in the cold, hard facts. How much is it going to cost me? How much is this going to take? How long is this going to take? Because I want tenants in there and I want to earn, start earning some money. That's, that's the be all and end all. And I totally get it. Um, so, you know, get a, get a lawyer that understands the investment strategies, because you might not be doing just a single buy to let or an HMO. You might be doing lease options, rent to rent, service to accommodation, which is a bit different. Um, and I love talking to people about the different ways they're investing. I think it's very, very interesting. Um, so you need a good lawyer who understands investment, charges reasonable prices, does things pretty quick. I mean, you can only go as quick as the seller solicitors, but you know, as, as much as you can get and keep the matter going and get it finished, that's the important thing. Get a good mortgage broker as well. Again, one that understands property investing. A lot of sort of, um, sometimes you need bridging finance for refurbs and um, you know, you need access to specialist lenders. Maybe you're looking at renting to the social care sector. That's a whole different type of specialist lending that you need. I work closely with a, a mortgage broker who's actually based in Cardiff, but he is, I think he's very young. I think he's about 28 or something. And he has a huge property uh, portfolio, massive following of property investors, and he sends all his legal work to me. So we work together really well. Um, <clears throat> don't forget as well, you need insurance. Make sure you get the right insurance broker um, because it's not, sometimes it's not just, you know, sort of simple landlord insurance you need. Um, there's different insurances you need for different types of properties. 
And also, if you're looking at refurbing the property, get a good planning consultant, a good builder um, who is, you know, aware of what you're trying to do. And lastly, I have an accountant, um, not just for my legal business, but but also to, to sort out my property investment, because um, you can get accountants that will advise specifically on property investors' portfolios. They have a different view on how to claim things properly if you're a property investor. So that's the sort of team you need to build around you um, to make sure your property journey starts off really well. Um, so how do you find these properties? Uh, well, you've got estate agents, obviously. There's lots of them. Uh, and I would say I've got a very good relationship with quite a few in Telford because of, of what I do. Um, and if I'm looking for a property, I will ring them up and say, hi, it's Maria. Um, look, I'm looking for a two bed house. Uh, this is my budget. Um, can you let me know what you've got? And they, if you start to build a rapport with an estate agent and they know that you are serious about investing and you are not going to waste their time, they will call you you will be on a little list and they'll say aha i remember maria was too bad i'm gonna ring maria first let's see if before i even get this on right move or whatever i'm gonna market it i'm gonna ring maria and see if she wants it so build a rapport with state agents as much as you can explain where your funds are coming from how are you going to pay they want to know like you're going to be serious and not going to mess them around um Another place is uh, Nimbus Maps, um, very good uh, software. Um, I think it's a subscription, but you can have free trials of it and get demos. I think Nimbus Maps, from my understanding, uh, limited understanding, is it tells you every property that's on the market in your area. You can go wherever, look, look all around the country. And I think for a fee, you can sort of say, well, I like that, 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 and that. You can pinpoint more. And then you, there's like, um, a uh, little page you can make up and it will, you know, tell you approximate like stamp duty, land reg fees. Um, I think Joanne might know a bit more about this, but because I've not done it. But if you try to build in refurb costs as well, um, it will kind of give you like if you bought this property, this is the potential of it in a nutshell. So I would recommend Nimbus Maps definitely. And you can get you can go on and have a look at a demo and then if you like it, you can get a 45 minute demo for free um, of someone who'll take you all through it. And it does also cover commercial property because that's another um, investment area that people sometimes don't think about when, when investing is, is commercial property. Um, again, finding properties. We've stuck with Telford because we know Telford. There's certain areas I'll buy in and there's certain areas that I won't. Um, and it's totally down to personal preference. If you think I, you know, I don't know Derby or Nottingham, whatever, but I fancy having a property there. Again, it's down to your research. Um, that might involve, you know, you going, having a look around, talking to your estate agents, whatever, and doing your own due diligence and having your own research done. But you can, and I, I do put a caveat on this, you can use property sources. I do know some good ones and I do know some bad ones. Um, so be very, very careful when choosing if you're going to use property sourcer. They will charge you quite a hefty fee to go and research areas and tell you, you know, if you buy this property for 100 and you do this, that and the other to it, refurb it, it's, it'll be worth 160, etc. cetera. Um, just make sure you pick a good one and that you, they have a proper property sourcing agreement in place and read it very, very carefully, um, because I've seen a lot of things go wrong with property sources. But as I say, there are good ones out there. So that's various different ways you can find um, properties. Um, <clears throat> HMOs, I think Joanne's covered very well. Um, I think it's personal preference again as to who you have in there. I've got clients who absolutely love students. Amazing, the best tenants they've ever had. Some of them hate them. <laughs> So it, it really is, you know, what sort of people you want to have in there, management, et cetera, um, and your licensing requirements and all your compliance and thing. It's a big, you know, a big, big sort of property, if you like, to, to manage. But if you get it right, um, then, you know, the, 
the income can be amazing. Um, with tenancy agreements, like we just have single buy to lets again, make sure there's some regulations surrounding that. Um, if you're buying a tenanted property already, I always check whether they have served the EPC, the gas safety certificate, certificate and how to rent guide on the tenant, protected the deposit within 30 days, because if you don't do that, um, the tenant can actually sue you for three times the amount of the deposit at any point during the tenancy. Um, and you will also have trouble serving a Section 21 notice, which is a notice um, that you would give to a tenant if you simply want them to leave within two months. You don't have any particular reason, you just want property back. You have to make sure all of these things will have been done at the start of the tenancy by the agent or by the um, landlord at the time. Also make sure your right to rent checks are in. It's a very, very important area that, um, you know, sometimes a lot uh, can go wrong with that. If you don't check, your tenant has the right to rent in the UK. You can be prosecuted, I believe. I haven't had any tenant, had any client happen to have that happen to them yet, but I know it, it, it is very serious. Um, electricity certificates now required every five years. That wasn't uh, necessary before, but now it's every five. Gas safety certificates every year. Um, again, it, that, these are regulations now that you must you must comply with. Um, your EPC rating as well at the moment needs to be an E, a minimum of an E. And I would say on that note, um, I was at a seminar, uh, Investors Network seminar the other week, and there was a guy there who was talking about EPCs. And by 2025, which isn't very far away, your rentals are going to have to be C rated. Now, a lot of, I mean, my properties at the moment are sitting in D. Uh, all I've got to do is whip around and put some energy saving light bulbs in apparently, and I'll get a C, which is great. But if your rating is rather on the very, very low end of an E and you're nearly in an F when you're buying the property, say now, I would say make sure that you know the costs, potential costs of getting it up to that C, because if you are not up to a C by 2025, it will be sort of, you know, sort of phased in. It won't be like a deadline of right, everybody's got to have a C, but make sure you can get there quite easily before you even buy a property. There's a property on the market at the moment I looked at and it's already an F and I'm not going to touch its barge pole because it's just going to cost too much money. Um, so, that's one of the key, key things to look at at the moment is EPCs um, uh, when, when you're when you're looking at your right move, you know, listing, usually there's an EPC on there. You, there's also an EPC register on the uh, on the Internet. You can have a look if you can get the number of the house. Um, you can easily find that. So so have a look at, at your EPCs. Um, Service accommodation, think about sort of Airbnb. That's another kind of way you can you can get into property investing, um, which is, you know, people staying for the weekend, people staying a couple of weeks. Um, there is also a, a very high demand for construction workers for service accommodation. So you might have, you know, five or six guys coming and staying for, you know, a few months at a time in the week, which can be very profitable if they're on a building site for a few months. Um, and I do have contacts of someone who has access, I think it's a public database, but I, I don't exactly know where it is. And that database will tell you um, where to find these construction workers. So if you want to contact for that, let me know. Um, think about management of service accommodation as well. You've got to, you know, people move, go in and out and in and out. You need it cleaned, you need it, you know, how are you going to deal with your bookings, um, et cetera. Also, when I look at um, title deeds for people who are thinking of running uh, service accommodation, you have to be very careful of the restrictive covenants on the title. There was a case back in 2016 where a, uh, a lady bought a flat and it said that uh, you must not use it for anything uh, that can become a nuisance. And it must not, uh, it must be used as a private residence with the restrictive covenant on the title. She rented it out as an Airbnb, um, it was a flat, and the people who were in the block got very annoyed that there was different people coming and going all the time. And she got sued by the landlord for um, the freehold owner of the block for a uh, breach of this restrictive covenant. Um, basically, the freeholder was trying to end the lease, saying she'd breached the covenant. And 
they, the tribunal that dealt with it basically said that the freeholder was correct. Um, the lease could be terminated because she had breached it. But they did say that this is very much um, a case that turned on this particular facts involved. So I'm not saying that every, you know, service accommodation, if they have this restricted common, it's going to be, you know, a problem. Um, but do be very careful of restricted covenants on titles. And I will obviously advise you if I think there may be a risk of you running something that wouldn't be permitted by the title. Um, I mentioned commercial properties. Again, that's something that people perhaps don't think about in investing. Um, don't forget, if you buy a commercial property, just like Joanne's done, you can convert it into residential, into flats, um, becoming very, very popular now. I've got a few clients doing that at the moment. Uh, but just make sure, as I've said before, you have a really good planning expert and builder on hand that uh, that can help you with that and, and get you through the, the, the hoops that you have to jump through with the local authority for such things. Um, Joanne's talked about private friends, finance, using friends, families, contacts you meet through these investor networks for, for, um, for getting funds together to buy properties. That's something I can deal with. Um, they might require a legal charge on the property like a mortgage lender would uh, to secure their interest. And, and that is, that is uh, becoming quite popular now, particularly if, you know, you may think you might have a problem getting a mortgage off a normal high street lender uh, or don't want to do it. You might want to do it that way. So that's something I can assist with. Um, <clears throat> leasehold properties as well. I uh, mentioned very briefly about leaseholds. Um, the length of the lease is very important. Uh, if you have anything sort of less than 60 years, you might struggle to get a mortgage on that. Um, my two flats have got about 90 years left on it when I bought it. Um, so we're, we're, we're okay at the moment, but I will be applying to extend those leases. Um, the quicker you get in and, and extend the leases, the cheaper it will be. I think mine's gonna cost a couple of grand on each one. And that will give me another, um, I think it's another 90 years, can't remember. Another 90 years on top of what I've got, it might be 125, I can't remember. But what is potentially going to go through Parliament soon, and I hope it does, and I might just hold out for this, is there is legislation pending that people with long leases can extend their lease to 999 years, which is nearly like having a freehold. Um, and it will mean your ground rent, whatever it is, will go down to a peppercorn. And then you don't have to worry about extending the leases anymore because it can be very costly, especially if you've got something, say, around 60 or 70 years. I've known premiums be 25, 30,000 pounds to extend a lease because the freeholders can basically charge whatever they like. Um, the only way to challenge it is to go to a tribunal, which is obviously going to cost you money. So leaseholds, although they can give you a very good rental yield, um, which is, you know, the, the amount of rent you'll get compared to how much you've bought the property for in, in summary, do you have to think about rental lease uh, lease term? Think about ground rents. If your ground rents over two hundred and fifty a year, you might have a a problem with lending. Um, two hundred and fifty pound a year for some weird reason was put in the uh, Housing Act nineteen eighty eight. Basically, if you've got two hundred and fifty pound a year, then uh, the lender it can be deemed to be an assured short hold tenancy, which is nothing better than what you've granted your tenant that's in there and obviously a lender's not going to think that's a particularly secure asset there are ways of changing that though the rent can be um, varied by deed with the freeholder if they're happy to do that but they will charge you or some lenders um, will uh, accept indemnity insurance against to the freeholder trying to repossess the property if you don't pay the ground rent so the important thing is is pay the ground rent and then there isn't really going to be an issue um so I hope that's a really good uh, kind of quick roundup of what I know, what I can do. Um, I'm very interested in providing, uh, you know, a quick turnaround. Uh, I can't always guarantee it because I'm reliant on sellers and things, seller solicitors and things for buying properties, selling properties um, in, in the investment area. And, and I also charge fixed fees. I will say straight away, because a lot of people say, well, how much are your fixed fees? My minimum is £800 plus VAT. That may or may not sound expensive to you, but um, I'm hoping that the service that I give you certainly justifies the cost. And, um, you know, I'm, 
I would really be looking forward to working with with anyone and I don't charge by the minute so if you want to ring me up and say hey Maria I've, I'm thinking of buying a property this is it what do you think what do I need to know I'll gladly speak to you and I won't charge you any money so that's um that's me uh Dawn's got my uh contact details I'll put them in the chat as well just in case because I didn't want any slides because uh, I'm a bit rubbish at slides uh so i'll put my details in the chat and just get in touch if you need anything thanks very much thank you maria that was really really useful you've got there's obviously so much information in there you've also got a lot of knowledge and experience um and and obviously nothing straightforward um a couple of questions i've written down um while you're while you were talking um you mentioned um, service to accommodation um and um people who are sort of working away from home and i know that's slightly different to um hmos but from how i understand it is that if somebody is working away from home you can still house them in an hmo but you just have to have a different type of agreement don't you yeah i mean most hmos um i mean granted asts short short, short hold tenancies but and normally they have to be for a minimum of six months, but you can put them in on license if you want. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's one way of, of doing it. Um, yeah. licenses, it's kind of gray area of the law, really. Licenses where are, are usually used where a person is in a property where they do not have exclusive possession of the entire property. Well, obviously, a person in an HMO doesn't. They've only got an exclusive use of their room. However, usually because of the length of time HMO tenants stay, they are granted a short, short hold tenancy anyway. But if you do have somebody who just wants a month or something, I don't see any problem in putting a license in place. The only potential risk you may have is that they, they might try to argue that they've actually been granted an AST and have further rights as a tenant. And getting through that argument you know you have to look at the various ways rent was paid etc uh, and the general the general gist on, on which the tenancy was granted so yes you can use licenses for hmos but most of the time i see asts granted but you, you could yeah use a license for a short term mm -hmm. okay thank you and you also mentioned with that leasehold property uh, sorry can you hear me all right yeah yeah, yeah. So you mentioned with that leasehold property that um, the if somebody was letting a room there to um, somebody who's working away from home and there was a restriction in the lease, would there be any difficulty with freehold properties, as in sort of the, the planning class, if somebody was renting it out, say, and it could be classed as a, an Airbnb or um, yeah, you sort of accommodation? Hold as well. Um... A lot of tenant, a lot of title deeds um, say, you know, must be used as a single, uh, as a dwelling for a single household or as a private residence. Um, see that quite a lot, usually on properties that are ex council. Um, they will stick things like that in there. Um, mm -hmm. You still can get, get issues with freehold properties as well. That particular case just happened to be a flat. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other question I had was uh, when you mentioned about extending uh, leases, uh, which I'd heard again about that, what you were saying, that they're, they're planning on sort of changing that to give people the right to extend for 999 years, which would be great. So this is a, a bit of an open question, really. But if somebody, say, had got a leasehold property um, and it was sort of the, obviously the, the length of the lease was reducing year on year, um, would you recommend that they, rather than extend the lease if they don't want to sell now, just hang on until wait for this new legislation or more information to come out? Yeah, it's difficult to say because I'm in the spot myself, you see. Um, I don't want to sell my two flats. I have actually approached the Reeking Housing Group to extend further freeholder, um, to extend my two leases. Um, I haven't heard back from them. I think they're very busy. But um, I... I'm a bit wary as to how long this legislation is going to take to get through because I personally think that they're going to have a, quite a bit of um, objection to this because with freeholders, particularly if they're like freehold companies, 
um, that have bought the freehold in the end off, say, a, a, a local authority or, or the Recon Housing Group or whatever, um, I that is a big money maker for them. And that that's why I think, you know, potentially there's going to be a lot of objections, but Parliament don't necessarily, aren't going to necessarily not put the bill through and, and put the legislation in place. Um, but then I sort of think, well, if you're going to give people the right to extend their lease for 999 years, why on earth do we need any more leasehold titles in a way? Mm. Yeah. You much got the freehold, but it's, it's the funny legal points. I don't know. So it, it really, it is, it's, it's a gamble. It's a gamble. If I wait too long, my leases might get down to 85 years and then I'm going to have to pay more to extend it if the bill doesn't go through. So mm. me personally, I'm going to try and get them extended as soon as possible. If I end up spending a couple of grand now and I could have had 999 years, oh well, I'll just, I'll probably just ask for the 999 years then. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I have got a couple of questions in the Q&A boxes. Um, first of all, from Jeff saying, I've always had difficulty with lending being self-employed. Because of this, I've not yet purchased my first property. A majority of my funds are locked into a first time uh, LIA, sorry, LSA savings account. Um, I assume purchasing an investment property would impact my ability to utilize these funds on a property for myself. Mm. Yeah, um, my, the, uh, when I went self-employed in June 2020, I spoke to my broker because I said, look, you know, I'm uh, quite surprisingly going to earn more money than I thought. I want to be buying a next one property, my next investment property soon. Now, he said to me, for buying an investment property, you usually only need one year's tax. For buying a residential property, you normally need two years tax return. So I would say if you've got two years tax return, I don't see why you couldn't use your lifetime ISA. I don't do a lot of work with lifetime ISAs, um, but I don't see why you couldn't use the lifetime ISA. Um, once you've got enough, it's the, it's the tax position the lenders are worried about. They want to see how much you've been earning in the last two years, really, if you're buying a, a, a residential property. Right. OK. Um, and someone else has asked a similar question. If somebody buys a property using a lifetime ISA, do they have to have a residential mortgage indefinitely or can it be switched to a buy to let mortgage at any point? Uh, good question. Answer, don't know, not how to do this, but um, I think it depends on the lender because, I mean, you can always switch your properties to a buy to let mortgage, but I think you, you would have to speak to the lender specifically because they do vary as to whether they care how you paid for it in the first place or not. Because really, when you think of it, your ice is only just somewhere where you've been clocking up some money to buy a house. Um, if you if you buy it in the first place as a residential house and say you live in it five years and then think, well, I want to change it to a buy to let. I would think most lenders wouldn't have an issue with that. I think if you were to buy it now and then say in six months, say, oh, I want to change it to a buy to let. They may be a little bit more suspicious as to whether that was your true intention in the first place. If you see what I mean? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And one more question. Um, are HMOs only in demand in certain areas? Um, for instance, Bridge North, which is a town nearby, um, would, would Bridge North be um, a viable demand or would there be a viable demand in Bridge North, for example? I, well, I suppose, I mean, John might be able to answer that, but I suppose generally uh, it, it Obviously, with a town like Bridge North, which, which is a small market town, there obviously wouldn't be as much demand as somewhere like Telford or Kidderminster or Worcester, for instance. Um, but um, I suppose it's, again, just look, try and look at, at these sites that Joanne had mentioned to see if there is any sort of demand there. But I mean, obviously, there's, there's still a, a, a working environment there. There are still people that are going to be looking for rooms. So I expect there's always going to be uh, a level of demand. So, would, would you say the same, Joanne? Sorry. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. I, 
I mean, exactly. I don't know the area at all, uh, but it's also whether there's any hospitals in the area, whether there is, obviously there's no universities and things, but hospitals are a good one. Uh, and uh, yeah, blue collar work of what's going on on the infrastructure around it, whether there's any factories, anything like that. So yeah, I, I don't know the area at all, so I can't really say, but yeah, a bit of due diligence, a bit of digging and you'll find out. Mm, yeah okay thank you um right well i'm conscious that we've we've run over time um this time so um i would like to thank um everybody for watching i uh, hope you've enjoyed the webinar today and gained some knowledge um, and advice from our guest speakers i'd also like to thank joanne and Maria for your time. Um, I know that you, you give your time for free um, and I hope everybody's found um, it really useful. I will provide both details, contact details for both Maria and Joanne um, when we send the uh, recording at the end, um, within a couple of days, we'll send the recording to all those that have registered and all those that have joined today. Um, we have been providing these webinars on a bi-monthly basis since the beginning of the year. Uh, with different guest speakers each time. And at the last webinar, um, for those who watched, we had um, a, a tax advisor from um, Mercy and Accountants called Graham Loosely, um, and he's based in Shrewsbury. I've since spoken to a couple of people who attended the webinar um, who have been in touch with Graham, and one has actually advised that he's actually saved 60% in his tax payments going forward. So um, that was quite useful. So I will be asking Graham to attend again, probably in the new year um, at the next webinar. Um, and hopefully we'll see Maria and Joanne again as well in future webinars if we've found them useful. Um, if um, there's any sort of particular subjects that people want to hear about, um, for instance, the EPC ratings um, changing and what the proposal are there um, or lease hold more sort of leasehold subjects then please let me know just message me directly and I will try and find the right speakers uh, and and to keep these um, these webinars going so again thank you very much to everybody thanks Joanne thanks Maria and hope to see you again pleasure all right great <laughs> Bye -bye.